Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. May the peace and blessings of Allah be upon you all. You're all welcome to this episode or program, Sharia Intelligence, where in this course we'll be going through a number of topics, inshallah, for a better understanding of how the mechanics of Islamic jurisprudence actually uh, operates, how it goes. I am your host, Muhammad Nuruddin Lemu, and with me to discuss this particular uh, subject, this particular program where we'll be looking at Sharia rulings. We have two gentlemen, Brother Ibrahim Bello and Brother Nasser Bello. You're most welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum salam wa rahmah. Today we'll be looking at Sharia rulings. And here we'll be looking at two types of rulings. Uh, those rulings that judge things as permissible or prohibited, uh, what are called that ahkam uh, sharia at taklifiyah the defining rulings, and we'll be looking at the declaratory rulings, or what they call the ahkam al wadiyya I'll start with a question to Brother Ibrahim Bello. Oh. What are Sharia's defining rulings, or this ahkam al taklifiya What are they and why are they important? Uh, Bismillah, alhamdulillah, we begin in the name of God. Praise and glory be to God. Um, for all intent and purposes, Islam tries to define the level of desirability or indesirability of actions. Um, this is good because then you know what is more preferred and what is just not permissible at all, and even what is discouraged. So to this extent, Islam is more comfortable with giving, assigning these rulings of desirability or undesirability to all actions, overtly and covertly. So in this case, you have like five of them between two extremes. The extremes are basically what is prohibited and what is mandatory. Okay, one extreme on the level of desirability is what you can call obligatory, wajib. And the other extreme is what you can call prohibited, meaning sinful by commission. The other one is sinful by omission. And between you have other rulings now that are more to the center of the spectrum. If you start from obligatory, things that are compulsory and sinful if omitted, like your five daily prayers, then you have those other ones that are desirable, recommended. Okay? like voluntary prayers and other examples. These things, though they are encouraged, but they are not sinful by omission. Then you have what is at the center of the spectrum between the two ends, which is your mere permissibility. Meaning if you do it, good. If you don't do it, there is no sin. Doing it does not give you any reward. Most of these things belong to things that are more of our day-to-day -day activity, eating, drinking, dressing, you know, interpersonal relations and some of those things. And then to the left side of the spectrum now, or closer to the other end, is what you have discouraged. Discouraged means preferred not to do. And if you avoid it, it is rewarded. But if you do it, you are not sinning. And then you have the last side of the extreme, which is haram, which is prohibition, okay? At all instances, whenever you commit it, you are sinful. God is not happy with you. Islam is not happy with you in that. So these are the levels of, uh, the, the rulings of liability, you call them. Yes. Could you add more when it comes to the Hanafi school? Because I know while in the other schools, there's generally five categories, as you've already mentioned. Yes. What is compulsory, recommended, what is permissible, neither encouraged nor discouraged, and then what is discouraged or tolerated, and then finally, what is prohibited, the Hanafis tend to add more than just that. Could you shed more light on that? Yeah, and usually, like uh, we said earlier, these rulings were defined and categorized based on the strength of evidence establishing them, or based on the emphasis the Prophet himself gave them. Okay? So, the emphasis he gave them define whether they are compulsory or you have a choice of not doing. Okay, but then from the Hanafi classification, they look at the strength of evidence establishing them. And so they differentiate between fard and wajib. 
To them, fold is what is established by an evidence that is cut e, absolutely certain and clear in meaning. So whatever ruling comes out of that, okay, mandating an action, they call that fard. So that will be something established by, say, Quran and Hadith Mutawatir. Yes, absolutely clear. Very clear, fine. Okay, clear in meaning, and the certainty and the authoritative of the authority of the evidence is on on dispute, indisputable. Now, anything less than that, they prefer not calling it fard, even though it's still sinful. If you omit, but rather they will use the word wajib for that. So in that case, they have two categories of at one extreme. Close to the other extreme of haram, they also look at the evidence establishing them. And those that have clear court evidence, like we say, cut is subut, cut is dilala. Clear in meaning and absolute uncertainty, okay, and is now prohibiting, they say that is haram. Anything short of that, but I still saying don't do, they will prefer to call it makruhu taharimi. Instead of the ordinary makruhu which is discouraged, they add this makruhu taharimi. But it's good to note that makruhu taharimi is still sinful if committed. While wajib and fard, okay, wajib is still sinful if omitted. So these are their own categorizations. So, you know, it's still the same spectrum, but they have seven categories now within. Excellent. Thank you very much. Brother Nasser, what would you add to what he has said? Well, um, as already established, Islam is a guide to entire Muslim's life. And being a guide, generally, to the way you live your actions uh, and the way you run your life, then there is a way of classifying your actions and categorizing them. And that is basically what the Akam Taklifiyah are actually trying to do. Um, if you look at how scholars define them, they say they are communication of the lawgiver uh, that commands or forbid or gives options in between. And the whole idea is for understanding the level of, you know, the values and level of desirability or under or otherwise of the of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now, as discussed by Brother Ibrahim, they are classified into uh, five according to the three schools of thought that is the maliki the shafi'i and the hanbali uh, where you have your fard or wajib clustered together then you have your mustahab uh, you have your mubah and then you have makru and haram while according to the hanafi school they expanded them to seven as earlier discussed uh, so these are some of the explanations or addition that i would uh, like to uh, I, I will add on this particular question Good. So, from what you're both saying, um, these ahkam taklifiyah seem to be different ways of categorizing desirability or undesirability of actions. And the job of a scholar is to try and find out which category does he or she put uh, any action in. So, uh, if telling lies, where would that fit in? Uh, if there's a new thing like cybercrime, where would that fit in? If there's uh, uh, anything, a, a new meal, a new type of dish, a new type of dressing, a new form of entertainment, uh, to be able to know where in, in this spectrum uh, do certain actions fall and that helps us know the extent to which we should pursue them and protect them or avoid them and protect others. Uh, from them and the ahkam taklifia I would assume are therefore those rulings that also apply to adult sane uh, Muslims uh, when it comes to how right or how wrong they are. Moving on on that, uh, could you give us more examples of what is fard or wajib, what is haram? Can we have more examples so that for those who are new to some of this terminology, um, we can see how a lot of our everyday actions fit into each of these value judgment categories. Brother Nasser. Now, as you beautifully captured or mentioned, um, these are things that are tied to responsible adults. And of course, if you look at the classification of the three schools or that of the Hanafi, um, Fard, according to the scholars, is something that 
is obligatory, something that is compulsory, something that there is sinful omission that is for not doing. And there are lots of examples that you can find in the religion around that, things around praying, five daily prayers, for example, things around fasting the month of Ramadan, things around being truthful, uh, saying the truth, things around standing for justice, and all that fall in the category of what is fard or wajib, according to the three schools. Now, if you come down to the level of mustahab, that is what is encouraged. There is no sin for, uh, uh, for, for omission, but there is a reward for commission. And these are things that are tied to nawafil, the nawafil of prayer, that is uh, nawafil of fasting, nawafil of the card that is giving charity, uh, and, and what have you. Then if you get to the other level, the next level, the level of muba, which uh, are, it is just free. You can do it, you may choose to do it. These are the areas of options that are given to every Muslim. You may decide to do it, you may decide not to do it. No sin for commission or omission. And these are things around, you know, culture, around the kind of food you eat, around the kind of dress you wear, so long as it's in line with the provisions of the religion, just like wearing a kaftan, for example, or eating this kind of meal or the other things that are known by the culture, so eating food and, and, and all that. Now, the next level is the level, and one interesting thing about the muba is such that uh, circumstance might decide uh, elevating it to the level of, you know, makru or discouragement. Uh, so uh, elevating it to the level of encouragement or mustahab, uh, this could be intention. Uh, and uh, so, I mean, circumstance and intention might decide whether it get elevated, where you are going to be rewarded probably because of the intention. And this is the area where scholars talks about uh, it falling under the category of things that you call ma'akulul ma'ana. You know why you are doing it. You eat food because you want to get energy. Uh, so if the intention is to gain energy to serve Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that elevates it to the level of ta'abudiya and you get rewarded for that. And in the other case also, if it gets it gets elevated because of the circumstance where you talk about issues around sadhu dhariya, where potentially it can lead to something that is harmful, then you see scholars uh, taking it down, sometimes even to the level of haram. Now, uh, the next level is makruh. Makruh are things that are disliked, things that are, uh, uh, things that are discouraged, things that are frowned upon. These are categories of things that uh, are not really haram. There is no any punishment for, for doing them, but they are things that are very closer to leading you to haram. And these are the things like gluttony, for example, overeating, uh, uh, bad breath, uh, untidiness, uh, and many other examples around that. And the last level is what we call haram. Haram uh, uh, is the direct opposite of your fard or wajib. That is when, uh, that, that is haram is discouraged, is prohibited, and is forbidden, and there is sin for commission. Just like the opposite of uh, your fard or wajib where there is sin for omission, for not doing. Uh, haram has sin for commission. And haram is also categorized or into two. We have haram in and of itself. Things that by themselves they are haram. And there are things that, that is what they call haram li dhatihi. And they have what they call haram li ghairihi. Things that originally they are not haram. But given the circumstance or context makes them haram. And that is why you find some of the tools that we are going to discuss much later about Saddu Dharia uh, and what have you, how things that are originally haram or through istihizan is now becoming ha haram, something that is halal is now becoming haram. Now, if you come to the second layer of classification of uh, Hanafi school, where they decided to separate between Fard and Wajib, as earlier discussed, where they talked about the level of certainty that is established and there you would find them trying to bring example of a wajib as like witri prayer for example where it comes from a wire that is ahad but it gives so for for hanafi school witri prayer uh, is something that is obligatory only that it's coming from a source that is zanni has of element of zanni so therefore they don't equate it to to to, to the level of five daily prayer now you can conclude by saying, according to the Hanafi school, we have 
six obligatory prayers instead of uh, uh, five obligatory prayers. Now, if you come down, as discussed by Brother Ibrahim Bello, at the level of Makaru, they divided into Makaru Taharimim and Makaru uh, Tanzihi. Now, for them, the difference between Haram and Makaru Taharimi is the fact that Makaru Taharimi are the minor sins, and Makaru Tanzihi are, uh, and Haram uh, covers the area of bigger sins. And, uh, and the other difference, apart from the issue of process of establishing authority or authenticity, is the fact that denying Makaru Taharimi or denying wajib does not lead to kufr. As against denying wajib, uh, I mean fard, or denying something that is already established as halal. Wallahu alam. Thank you very much. Uh, Brother Ibrahim, yes, sir. on the subject of this um, fard and wajib, you know, a lot of examples have been brought. Uh, could you shed light on the difference between things that are wajib for an individual and things that are wajib for a community. Uh, the fardu ayn, fardu kifaya. Yeah. Um, could we have a few examples of these? Uh, yeah, indeed. The, it's true that uh, there are things that Islam makes mandatory on individual. And so if an individual miss them, he sin. And there are other things Islam also makes mandatory or obligatory on a community, on a group of people, in a household. This is called fardu kifaya, meaning some others can suffice for others. In other words, there are more social responsibilities. So, for example, you see five daily prayers, Ramadan, Wudu, you know, don't lie, and all those things mentioned are obligatory on each and every individual. But then you have those like collective responsibility you call for the kifaya. From the textual basis, they tell you that you need to have a scholar in a community that knows about how to share inheritance, how to share zakat, how to do a funeral prayer. But then it goes beyond that. Whatever is a necessity for the survival of Muslim community, it becomes necessary follow the kifaya on that Muslim community to have members that study or partake in it. So you need a consultant, gynecologist, nephrologist, neurologist, okay, a technical person that can repair electricity, you know, whatever. You need Muslims in the police, you need Muslims. All the things we do as social responsibility actually follow the kifaya. Because you look at it from the other perspective, if you don't do it, Muslims are absent. Muslims stand at disadvantage. So this is how Islam look at it. So you can see that all these things are called fardu kifaya. Why are they kifaya? In the sense that if some people take part, then the other people are not seen and they suffice on behalf of others. Yes, sir. Well, thank you very much. Yes, please. And I think another interesting classification of this fard of a thing, apart from the fardu ayn and fardu kifaya, um, you would find scholars looking at uh, classifying fard into what they call fard mutlaq and fard muwakkat, that which is open-ended can be done at any point in time and that which is tied to time, specific time, like prayer for example, uh, uh, like uh, hajj for example, these are things that are tied to time. And you will equally find them uh, uh, coming up with another classification of muhaddad and ghayru muhaddad those that are restrict, restricted when it comes to quantity of how you do them, the number of uh, uh, cycles or the number of things you do in trying to discharge like them. Exactly, maybe rakad in prayer. And those that are endless, they are just open. Like no, sadaka. No. And wonderful. And uh, so I think uh, probably just uh, very important points you've raised, but just to underscore this question of the fardu kifaya, yeah. not being restricted to just burying the dead and Friday prayers and, yeah. you know, some of these, but to every essential service yes. required for a community where if that service is not provided, the community or society will go into a state of dire need, darura, uh, or even haja uh, as it affects a community, it will get into crisis, a state of emergency. Yes. And so having professionals in various areas becomes 
uh, necessary, it's a darura to have these people, and by extension, a fardu kifaya, uh, collective responsibility on the community to ensure that we have people performing these roles as a religious requirement, not yes. just some secular dunya, no. it's just my job, but it's my service uh, as a religious requirement. Yes. Uh, and I think the very interesting point you made, that in the Hanafi school, you actually have six compulsory prayers in the day. Yes. However, if you listen to the Hanafi wording, they would say five of those prayers are fard. One is wajib. In other words, there's a nuanced difference. Yes. Uh, so they all agree with the five daily prayers that are fard. So if you say how many fard prayers, they will say five. Uh, but when you say wajib, they will say yes, witr is wajib, but not uh, on the same level as the other five. So these nuances really important so that when we hear scholars saying things and it sounds as if there's a difference of opinion, looking more carefully, we actually find sometimes we misrepresent or misunderstand scholars. What I'd like us to please look at, Brother Ibrahim, is the context of these laws. The the, the, the declaratory laws, as they are sometimes called, the Akam al Um What are they? Why are they important? Um, why should we know about them? Because we usually all know just the Akam al this is Haram, Fard, Mustahab, uh, you know, uh, Wajib, etc. Uh, most people have not heard of the Akam al In Usul al Fiqh, why is it important to know about these? Malam Ibrahim. No. Ahkamul Wadi'iyya, or more appropriately put, is um, declaratory rulings. Are those rulings that are concerned with when, where, who, to what extent? They concern with conditions for validity of an action, conditions that makes an action or an act necessary. Conditions that uh, make something do, okay, like, like now for zakat, is a condition that it must reach nisab. It's a condition that aside from farm produce, it must have what you call haul, a year. Okay, for prayer, it has time, shuru to siha. Okay, you have conditions for perfection or validity. You have conditions that makes it necessary for validity of faction, when to, who to, okay, and whom, whom should it be given to, on whom is it necessary, and sort of things like that. If you take each action, it has these conditions around it. You say Ramadan is wajib, yes. Upon who? A mature person. But it has what you call money, things that will prevent you from fasting, such as what? If a lady menstruates, or dwelling postnatal bleeding and some of those things. So all these kind of rulings are called akam al wadi'iya. For nearly all the actions, you have these things attached to it. Hajj is wajib. When, of course, it has to be time. You don't go on Hajj this month. Okay, upon who? For who can afford? And a number of these kind of conditions they are called akam al wadi'iya. They are concerned with the validity. Okay, enablers. Money, things that are hindrances, like you say you can inherit, okay? But there are money, things that will prevent one from inheriting, and a number of all those sort of things. So this category of rulings that declares or makes something in enablers or prevent or hinder, and things around it are called akamul or They are important that we know them, so that you know that there are conditions before an action. And that's why, particularly, like, let me take Salah. So scholars will have shurutul wujub, conditions that make Salah compulsory. If they become compulsory, you have shurutul siha. What are the conditions that we we'll look at and we we'll say, yes, your prayer is valid. And so with many actions, like I say. So this is the little about declaratory rulings. Al Nasser, what would you add? Well, um, I think uh, the first point is the fact that these declaratory rulings, what we call Ahkam al Wada'iyya, have or are established, have basis in the text or in the Quran and Sunnah, just like the earlier discussed defining laws. And they are essentially 
the communication of the lawgiver in declaring what is uh, suburb, uh, the, that is cause, uh, the condition, which is shard, and of course minor hindrance, uh, how they affect other things like the akamul taklifiya. And uh, what they actually are looking at, uh, trying to facilitate. The most important thing is there are situational factors that facilitate the application of Ahkamu Taklifiya. Secondly, they also are interested in understanding whether the ruling based on a particular text is able to uh, align itself or in line with, is in line with the objective of that particular text itself. And they are concerned with appropriateness of the ruling when it comes to application. Essentially, they facilitate application of Ahkamul uh, Taklifiya. They are like enablers uh, where, uh, when it comes to application of Ahkamul Taklifiya. This is interesting. In other words, um, why the Ahkamul Taklifiya, which are telling you that this is halal, haram, makru, mustahab, uh, declaring how desirable or undesirable something may be, the Ahkam taklifiya give the context to when that is appropriate. Yes. Uh, so what you would say, probably another way of putting it is to say, uh, when you say something is haram, there are certain terms and conditions. Those term con terms and conditions are the Ahkam al the declaratory rules. Yes. Um, in certain fields, when you make a statement in economics about an economic situation, you would say ceteris paribus. Uh, all things being equal yeah. um, or in chemistry you would say water boils at 100 degrees centigrade STP under standard temperature and pressure mm. uh, in other words there's a context to all these statements yes. and that the the Akamal Wadiya give the context for when something is appropriately haram and this is appropriately fard and this is appropriately this and I think this is this is really important so that uh, uh, it's as you said, people also know these conditions are also text-based themselves. And so when some of those conditions change, naturally the rulings around them will change. The next natural thing would be to get some more examples. Malam Ibrahim gave some examples. Brother Nasser, can you give us examples of these declaratory rulings as they apply to everyday life? Um, there are a lot of examples actually that are tied to these very important declaratory rulings that is around the issue of uh, causes, around conditions, around hindrance. For example, divorce, it's only possible when there is marriage. So marriage is a condition for the existence of divorce. Um, prayer of Maghrib, for example, can only happen when sun sets. So it is a condition. Um, uh, the hadith that talks about um, not allowing or not giving uh, inheritance to the person who murdered for that purpose, uh, the fact that he murdered that particular person that is going to inherit from has now become a hindrance for him to get inheritance that is originally uh, somebody that is uh, entitled for or somebody that uh, has written a will or a bequest that certain amount after my death should be given to somebody. If that particular person killed him for the purpose of getting access to that particular uh, you know, uh, resources, then uh, Sharia will now use that as a hindrance for him to access that uh, uh, the, the wealth or the resources that was actually allocated to him in the will. Um, uh, another example is ablution. Ablution is a condition for prayer. If you don't have ablution, then if you pray, it is not going to be accepted. So there are lots of examples. The issue of uh, obligation of fasting the month of Ramadan and the hindrance of, uh, you know, menstrual cycle for a woman or the issue of not reaching the age of adulthood uh, or, that, illness or, or illness or any mm -hmm. other, you know, factor or element that are actually hindering you from accessing, uh, from, from, from discharging such responsibilities. Good. So, and I mean, Ibrahim Bello, you've given uh, a number of other examples, uh, and I think just reiterating. So, what you're saying is these akama taklifia 
these value judgment that this is haram and this is fard and this is mustahab are not without a context. Of course. They are not absolute statements that apply in every situation. Absolutely. They are yes. dependent on the fact that certain other rulings, certain hindrances, as you said, certain conditions, certain suburb or causes are in existence. In other words, there's a context to every ruling, and when the context changes, the rulings also change. Now, this takes us to the last question I want to ask, Brother Ibrahim. The difference between a hukum and a fatwa. Uh, we usually hear the hukum of Sharia on this issue is this, and there's a fatwa on that. Um, what is the difference between a ruling, a hukum, and a fatwa? You've described the ahkam of taklifiyah as ahkam, and wadiya as also ahkam. Um, what, what is a fatwa? How is it different from uh, a hukum? And what's the difference in just how they are each arrived at? Yes. Okay, hukum, like uh, we know, sometimes you have these technicalities in Islam that sometimes they mean the same thing and some other times <laughs> they mean different things. You know, like Ibn Taymiyyah would say it, Yani, ya mutaradi fatil Quran. Sometimes, if they come together, they have two meanings. But if they exist independently, each take the meaning of the other, like Islam and Iman, like Mumin and Muslim. Now, something with a hukmu and fatwa in a more general sense, in that sometimes when you say, What's the hukum of alcohol? It's haram. What's the fatwa of drinking alcohol? It's still haram. But in a more technical and more like broader, like specific sense, hukumu is that divine ruling that is permanently attached to a particular action. Why fatwa is that contextual ruling that resulted as a result of context? So it means to say something might be haram, but a context will warrant making it halal or making it makruh. This is the difference. Let me give a better example. The hukum of alcohol is haram, right? But somebody in a state of haja, and that's the only thing that he needs to take to survive, no any other option. Alcohol becomes temporarily permissible, but that's fatwa. That's not the hukum. And so it applies to many other things too. Studying something might be for the kifaya, but as a state of haja, when a community in the state of haja die need for it, the hukum will become fardu ain. The fatwa will now be it is fardu ain. And that is why, for instance, during Hajjah til Wada, the people came to Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and they were asking. Usually you have an agreed order, depending on which schools of thought, of the kind of actions required on the day of the tenth day of Hajj, Zul Hajj. But because of crowd and because some of them were new to it, they came to Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam with all sorts of questions regarding the various order. Some shaved before going to throw stone. Some did tawaf before doing this. And the Prophet would say to all of them, La haraj, la haraj, it's okay, it's okay. These kind of situations are called fatwa. It's not that that's the hukum. So I hope we're getting it. That hukum is permanent. Okay? Fatwa is contextual, condition, context, who, when, where, what are the circumstances surrounding it, might change it. But that's just because of that condition. So this is fatwa. And that's why we should be very careful, not rushing to judge. And we said, we had a scholar say, oh, you can take certain percent of alcohol in some things, or you can do this. We should try to understand under which context and condition is he saying that. Allahu Allah. Excellent. So, I mean, uh, I like the warning you gave that there can be a ruling from the Sharia that makes alcohol prohibited, uh, but then a scholar gives a separate ruling that it is permissible in this context. And unless one knows what context has changed, the, how the Ahkam al Wadiya have changed, and therefore why the ruling uh, has changed, you quickly judge that the scholar probably knows nothing about Islam or 
uh, and I think there are many examples of people accusing scholars. Yes. I mean, before we go into that, uh, Brother Nasser, what more can you give on the similarities or differences between fatwa and Well, hukum? Well, I think the nature of similarities and differences between hukum and fatwa are actually tied to a variety of contexts, and therefore you will find a lot of perspectives coming as a result of differences in context. As he rightly mentioned, uh, sometimes they are seen within the context of hukum being independent, uh, while fatwa being tied to a context, so completely dependent on context. Uh, you could also see fatwa, uh, I mean hukum, as something that is more permanent, while fatwa is something that is temporary. It is contextual, uh, it is dependent on lots of, uh, uh, I mean, variables that are tied to context. And also, uh, hukum uh, is seen as a text-based norms uh, that are already known, and while fatwa are exceptions to those rulings that are tied to, uh, that are actually independent and text-based, and therefore they are ex an exception that are tied to context, they are sort of a, a movement from what seems to be independent, depending on the influence of the context. Another perspective of this kind of relationship or difference is tied to the context of a judge and a mufti, where a judge, if he, uh, whatever ruling made by a judge is seen as binding, uh, and therefore it is a hukum, while in the case of a mufti, it is not binding, and therefore it is a fatwa. Allahu ta'ala alam. That's very interesting. In other words, um, it's important to know the context and the particular meaning that each of these words uh, has. Sometimes the meanings are synonymous. Uh, sometimes hukum refers to more the text-based position of the sharia with the circumstances of the akam uh, al around. Um, Sometimes the more permanent ruling is called the hukum and the temporary exception is called a fatwa. Sometimes the opinion of a judge is what is called a hukum and the judge is sometimes called a hakim or a qadi. Uh, but the judgment of a judge which is binding is sometimes called a hukum whereas the opinion, the answer given by a jurist or a mufti to a particular thing which is non-binding because you can go and listen to another jurist that you may feel more comfortable with. Uh, these are opinions of muftis. So while the two can be synonymous, it is important to know the context. In English, we just call them all rulings or religious verdicts. Uh, but when it comes to usul, there are differences. And just as fatwas can change from one place to another, hukums change when the ahkam al wadiya change, when those contexts that make the hukum Haram, when those contexts and variables change, then the hukum also changes with context. So all are changeable, but some are more stable than others. We'll stop there, inshallah, for now. Until next time, Jazakumullah Hayran, Brother Nasir, and Brother Ibrahim. Uh, Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.